If I have it, I might be told you have an aneurysm. And that's scary. But I promise you the scariest thing is to have one and not get checked and then it ruptures and you don't make it or you make it, but you're not independent. You can't enjoy life. Just the fact that I had relatives that had had bleeding on the brain, I now know that that's something that I should have brought up to my primary care physician. It is a life-saving conversation. It is my pleasure to welcome everybody. I'm Christine Buckley with the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. I ask everybody, please do stay muted. Um, we have a wonderful session ahead of us on brain aneurysms, the family trail and what to know. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Spiota here, who's from MUSC, the Medical University of South Carolina, professor of neurosurgery and neuroendovascular surgery. Um, he, he's great because he cares so much about the patients, not just in treating them, but in their follow-up and their care after treatment. So we are thrilled to have him be a part of this webinar and share. And I'm also thrilled to welcome Sharon Epperson, Senior Personal Finance Correspondent at CNBC and Brain Aneurysm Survivor. I mean, Sharon is just wonderful in how she shares her story and her passion for this disease and to educate. So I wanna thank you both for doing this. So welcome everyone. Um, we have a large number of people probably joining. A lot of you submitted questions prior that I will address at the end. The session is being recorded and you'll get that in the next day or two. So to get things rolling, Sharon, your question number one, can you please share the story of your brain aneurysm journey from rupture treatment to recovery? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you, Christine, for inviting me to participate in this webinar. And I want to thank all of you that are tuning in and are ready to, in a few days when the recording's ready, share this with your friends, your family members, your primary care provider, and other caregivers and loved ones, because it's so important to me to share my story, but many of you have this, a similar story. Um, in 2016, I was working out at a core bar studio. I was trying to stay healthy. I'd had my spinach shake in the morning and uh, was getting to work out in before I went to work, before I went to the studio. And I had the worst headache that I've ever had. And, and it wasn't a normal headache. I shouldn't even say the worst headache I've ever had. I just had never felt anything like it. And I knew something was terribly wrong. I was actually stretching, you know, I was not like lifting weights or doing anything, anything too strenuous. I was trying to, you know, kind of get in shape for the morning. And when I felt that I asked, I, I immediately left the studio and I got to the parking lot and then realized I couldn't really turn my head. So I couldn't drive myself home. And I texted my husband and he picked me up and he took me home. I should have gone straight to ER, but we didn't know what it was. And I thought if he ran out and got me Starbucks, I had my latte, I'd be fine. And I absolutely was not. So we then went to a prim primary care physician and my physician was not there that day. So I went to the person who was there able to see me. And thankfully, he also recognized that it could be a worst case scenario and immediately sent me to the local hospital to have imaging. That imaging was a CT scan that showed bleeding on, bleeding on my brain. Um, and they were not prepared at that time. That hospital didn't have the capability to do a craniotomy, which is what I needed, and to have a clipping done. I have two clips that um, I had in the surgery I had at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx in New York. And that procedure um, was completed from the time I took the nine o'clock bar class to about 9 p.m. that evening was my journey of the rupture. Um, after that, I was in the hospital for about two weeks in ICU, um, unable to really sit up or stand up, move my legs, do any of that movement for about most of those two weeks. Um, and when I was finally able to get up, I thankfully was able to walk. I was, since I am a TV reporter, thankfully I was able to talk as soon as I was no longer intubated. I was able to talk, but I don't really think I was saying anything that was all that coherent, but I was able to speak. Um, and so I had to learn how to walk again, how to balance, how to climb stairs. I'm a business journalist, so I had to learn how to balance a checkbook and, and read numbers and do all those things. And that's what I learned how to do in two weeks in rehab and many months of uh, physical therapy, uh, speech communication therapy after that. Um, and I think one of the most important parts for me of my um, journey and trying to recover has been being able to have a neuropsychologist that I asked for because I'm also a mother of two 
and I couldn't imagine going back home right away. And thankfully, I, I did have two weeks in rehab, but I just, I knew my life would never be the same, not like it was before. And so finding someone eventually in the, in the first month or so after I was out of rehab was really helpful. And I continue to see that person today. Um, she also recommended that I have a neuropsych assessment. Um, and she, her advice was for me to do it six months out, could be even nine months out, um, because I knew I wasn't going to be able to go back straight back to work as a reporter. And um, I, but I think I was anxious just to know what is this and how bad is it? So I, I had a neuropsych assessment about three months out and um, determined that I really should take the time to do as much therapy as I could. And thankfully, my employer allowed me to be on disability for a full year. Um, and then I returned to, to work part time. And I was working part time until the start of the pandemic. Um, and then I started working from home five days a week. So it, 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 has been, um, it has been quite a journey. And I am passionate, Christine, about being an advocate for other survivors and also finding out more about what happened, why this happened. Um, I participated in my first genetic study that was looking at the long-term um, disability outcomes of people who have had subarachnoid hemorrhages, as I did, and many of you did after your rupture. And um, and so, you know, very simple, did it at home, didn't have to go back to a hospital, a doctor's office or anything. So I'm, I'm very eager to hear more about what Dr. Spiota has to say about how we can really not only help our family members, but help ourselves and help the medical community know more about what happened to us so that it doesn't happen to anyone else. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate you sharing that. So Dr. Spiota, how common is a scenario like Sharon's? Absolutely. And first off, Sharon, thanks so much for joining and sharing your story. And by the way, what a tough act to follow with a professional. <laughs> so thanks, Christine. But I will try. But and Christine, thanks for your um, never-ending passion like mine to, to further ed education of families and patients. A quick background why I've been involved with the Brain Injuries Foundation. One of my strongest missions and passions is to spread the word in particular about family history because it happens in one in five patients that come in with a rupture. And when it happens in a family, it's so common, so pervasive. I've treated sisters, mother, sister, grandmother, mother, daughter, aunts. And it's just amazing to me that the word hasn't got out, gotten out there and people just aren't aware of it. Most physicians are, but even in, in some primary care doctors may just have not realize that. So it is so utterly important to spread the word. And the story, I know Christine's heard the story. I had a patient who I treated for the ruptured aneurysm remotely 10 years prior. Um, had been lost to follow up and had a second rupture. She had multiple aneurysms, also a very young patient. Treated six or seven of her aneurysms, also successfully. Had a strong family history, plus the multiple aneurysms. Her sister, who was also nearby me, despite me counseling my patient, her sister just never got screened. And this is me three or four years trying to convince her to get screening. My patient trying to convince her sister to get screening. Never did out of fear, I think is the most, most common reason. In the last fall, when I saw her in follow-up, she's doing great, but she tells me her sister had a rupture and died on the spot. So despite the efforts in education, people are just so afraid to get screened. So it's so important that we talk about the importance of it. And also I wanna reassure having an aneurysm is very, very scary. Uh, but having a, a aneurysm in the rupture is much, much worse. So we can we can address, we can closely monitor and treat aneurysms. In the last 10 or 20 years, the advancements are just remarkable. So how we can approach and treat aneurysms now, much safer, much more effective than it ever was. And every six months or a year, we continue to push the field forward. So it is scary, but don't let that preclude you from getting screened and know that we are very good at treating aneurysms. So we continue to get better every year. But Sharon's story is very typical. Um, the worst headache of the life is the, sort of the textbook presentation for an aneurysm. And then that neck pain that you described as the aneurysm, which is an outpouching, it's a bubbling of the artery, right? And it happens most commonly where the arteries take a turn, a fork in the road at a bifurcation. So when the, art, when the blood goes left to right down those branches, the crotch or the fork in the road, every time your heart beats, it gets a little bit of a pounding and that is a mechanical stress. So imagine the chairs we're all sitting on, if you start wiggling them, if you keep wiggling, at some point, those shoes will start falling apart. 
and the chair will fall apart. So it is a wear and tear. So it does is an acquired problem. You're not born with them. They do develop over time. But things like smoking, because they damage and weaken the artery walls, are a predisposing factor because that wear and tear happens sooner and you're more likely to form the bubble. And what happens with that little bubble that forms over time as it gets larger, the artery itself is not growing. As the bubble is enlarging, the wall of that bubble is just stretching and being thin. And when that ruptures, and the frightening thing is sometimes you can have zero warning signs like Sharon um, described. The only sign can be when it ruptures. And when it ruptures, it causes what's called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And there's bleeding around the base and the fluid filled spaces of the brain. And that both the pressure of the blood spike as well as the irritation of the blood sitting in that space gives that severe headache. That spinal fluid in the brain communicates with spinal fluid in your spine. Some of you, if you've had kids, you may have had a spinal um, or epidural anesthesia. And as that blood settles down the neck, that's what gives a severe neck pain. So Sharon's story is pretty typical. And we often hear stories about it happening during exercise, power yoga, um, oftentimes during intercourse. And this is just something that we think during activities like this, you can get a blood pressure spike and that can just be enough to rupture the aneurysm that was already fragile to begin with. But Sharon, um, you know, kudos to you for, for not just going home and, and seeing the coffee would take ever persisting, presenting to your primary care. And your primary care physician was a hero to immediately identify it and send you to the hospital. Because having an aneurysm mm -hmm. rupture is one of the most, people talk about heart attacks, strokes, ruptured aneurysm is up there with any one of those. Very, very deadly. One in three people are dead before they hit the ground. So those are patients I don't even see. They don't even come to the hospital. And then of those overall, just under half of them will not make it. And of those that do make it, a third are never the same where they're totally dependent. So it is having a ruptured aneurysm is as severe as you can possibly get in medicine. Thank you, Dr. Spiota. Um, Sharon, can you explain when and how it was that you found out that brain aneurysms are part of your family history? Yeah, um, you know, uh, I'm sure some people are like I am right now. I mean, I know these statistics. I've read them on the Brain Aneurysm Foundation website, but hearing them and realizing that I'm talking to you, I'm just so very grateful. And so um, my family history, I, I knew as a young child, it, it, I took pride in the, in the ability to be able to say cerebral hemorrhage because I never knew my grandfather because my mom told me that four months before I was born, he'd passed away from a cerebral hemorrhage. Um, I also learned early on, I was a toddler when my mother's oldest sister passed away and she had a cerebral hemorrhage as well. Um, but that was in the early 70s and, and it was almost 50 years later before anything happened to me. So I didn't think in any course of my adult life to mention to a primary care physician about my grandfather or my aunt having cerebral hemorrhages. And I will tell you, Christina, it was not until I went to bafound.org that I figured out that there could possibly be a family history here because as Dr. Spiota said, there are warning signs, there are risk factors. I didn't have any of them. I'm not a smoker, I didn't have hypertension. I was trying to take care of myself and exercise and I couldn't figure out why me. And you know, why not me? It's, I, it happened to me because it happened to, I later found out three family members. My mother's gra grandfather, my great grandfather, on my same side as my grandfather also passed away from a cerebral hemorrhage. Now in those days, there was not even an MR angiogram. There was no, you know, there may not have even been an MRI machine back then. There was no way that, that we could really tell what it was. Um, but just the fact that I had relatives that had had bleeding on the brain, I now know that that's something that I should have brought up to my primary care physician. And, um, and so when I found out, I was, you know, in the very early stages of recovery, my sister and my mother found out, my sister immediately went and had an MRA and she has had a clear scan five years later as well. Uh, my mother, a couple years later, because of the fear of Dr. Spiel is talking about, I think, and thinking in my eighties, why do I need to do this? Um, she took a couple years to do it, but she did it as well. And she has clear scans. Um, I have a first cousin that's also had uh, is a breast cancer survivor, and she's had full body and MRAs as well. So, um, and she is clear for aneurysms. 
but I do worry about my 17 year old daughter and my 20 year old son. And I worry about what, when they should be scanned. And most important, I wonder about what happens if, and what do I do and how will I react and how should they react? And I think that that is the fear, Dr. Spiro, that so many survivors have, because I would not wish anyone to go through what I went through. I do, in fact, consider it a great blessing for me because I was able to survive and can now talk about it. Um, but I really, I, 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 I am scared about that. And I think a lot of people are um, concerned about what, what will happen next and, and how to, to deal with that. But now I know, and my, my primary care physician knows and every doctor I talk to and, you know, often NBC and CNBC and coworkers and, you know, people I'm interviewing, it's amazing how many people like you who are listening right now and watching right now are affected by this, either by a friend, a neighbor, a family member or themselves. And so um, I'm just glad that I can then share with people my story, but also the resources and the fantastic neurosurgeons like Dr. Spiro who want to help all of us, even though we can't all get to South Carolina. So there's a way for us to find out more information and share this information. Um, I just wish I had known about the family history and been more forthcoming, but I think it's true for anything that you have in your family. You have to talk about it. And just having a home going service and a funeral for the loved one, that's all well and good. But why did that happen? It's not that you're trying to pry. It's not that you, you know, want to delve into family business or share family business. It is a life saving conversation. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate that. And yeah, you're spot on with that last comment. So Dr. Spiota, can you please tell us the statistics on familial aneurysms? And what is the best protocol for screening? And what is the obstacles for people to get screened? Sure, absolutely. I'm going to share my screen, Christine, to, to uh, help drive some of these points home. So I'm going to show just a couple of slides is important, important take home points. One is about risk factors for aneurysms. The next will be risk factors for aneurysms rupturing. You'll see some are overlapping, some are a little bit different. So risk factors for having an aneurysm, 3% of the population. So it's not that, that uncommon. Smoking, you can see this, the statistics, four times more likely hypertension. We saw in Sharon's case, she didn't have either one of, them, one of those. Female gender, there's nothing we can change. We don't know exactly why it is, but it's much more common in females than men. And then you can see the family history. So if your family has a um, strong family history of aneurysms, you're almost three times as likely to have one. If there's multiple aneurysms and you yourself have multiple aneurysms, you're more likely to have additional aneurysms. Now, with regards to risk factors for aneurysm rupturing, that's really the biggest concern. Smoking again is being shown again. Prior rupture from another aneurysm. For example, Sharon had a ruptured aneurysm. She's doing great, fortunately, although she alluded to the, the difficulties that everybody has, even in the best scenario with needing therapy and time off from work. So even in the best scenario, it may take a year or two to feel like you're back to 99%. And some people never feel like they're actually ever at 100%. So the biggest win is probably you can get to really close to be 100%. But now Sharon, because she had a personal history of herself of a rupture, that's the most intimate family history is you yourself. Second would be a twin sister, which we see often also then you're also much more likely to develop aneurysms, the second one down the road and have a problem. So you have to be watched very, very closely. The family history of ruptures. If you have a sister, a story with a sister and an aunt, sister and a grandmother, mother and grandmother with ruptures, then that's the biggest, you can see the huge uh, impact that it has on your own risk. And these other ones are very important when we choose to closely follow and not necessarily treat aneurysms right off the bat. So we may follow an aneurysm, and if an aneurysm is shown to grow in size, that's a big concern. And that would, tr that would trigger, generally speaking, of course, there's always uh, unique circumstances, but generally speaking, if we're following an aneurysm, especially a family history, or we see it, or both, that we see it growing in size, that concerns us. The next thing we'll see is a rupture. So that would prompt a discussion about whether treating is right for you. Again, it's all dependent on a lot of individual factors. There's a lot of emphasis on the size of the aneurysm, but as you see the irregular shape, you can see that little cartoon in the bottom. I think everybody has good intuition that compared to a nice spherical shape that's smooth, this which looks like a double ice cream scoop with a cherry on top, that just looks more fragile, that looks more sinister. That is a weak spot on the weak spot. So irregular shapes concern us more 
that they're more likely to rupture. So that could trigger treatment earlier, even if it was of a smaller size. Um, so those are very important considerations. But really every aneurysm that we evaluate, I have a discussion with the patient. Oftentimes the families there will look at the pictures. I think it's so important when ask your physician, show me the pictures. Because when you talk about an aneurysm, it's somewhat abstract, but when you actually see the pictures, we can draw things out. It just helps to understand it. And we come up with an individualized game plan because every aneurysm and every patient in the setting of your family, other risk factors is just a unique circumstance. So we have to make a decision together what's the best treatment plan for you. As far as screening, and Sharon's story is a pretty common one where she has an aneurysm that's ruptured and now she's looking to get more information and she has these cerebral hemorrhage, quote unquote, um, in her family, but it, they were predating the, even the era of CAT scans. So we can't know definitively, was it an aneurysm or not? In those cases, because, because missing or failing to act on a strong family history has so many bad repercussions, when it's unclear, we just assume there are aneurysms. We can't prove that they were not. So we're gonna just assume that they are because that's the worst case scenario. Not that there aren't other reasons why, you know, your relatives could have had uh, hemorrhages, but because that has such impact on you and like you alluded to your children, we just assume they're aneurysms. Often I'll ask people in my clinic, it's rare that people come with a prepared, clean history. You know, my, some do, you know, the list, my grandmother had aneurysm at this age, my mother at this age. So often we'll ask if they don't, if they don't know, they hadn't thought about it. Had there been people in your family that died for unexpected reasons, just suddenly in their forties and fifties. And then, well, wow, you know, I had an uncle, a, a grandmother, that could be a, a red flag. And again, we can't always definitively track it down and prove it, but that is suspicious enough of itself. And with the family history being such an important consideration, we would assume those to be aneurysms because we can't prove that they were not. And that's when we definitely would recommend to treat, uh, I'm sorry, to screen people in your family for aneurysms. So how to screen the two modalities, the, the one that's most commonly employed first is the MR angiogram. That's a non-invasive, you slide in the table. Some people are a little bit claustrophobic, you just put your head in it, you're not putting your whole body in it. You, there's a little bit of loud sounds, it's, it's magnetic based. So they check you to make sure you don't have any metal that could be unsafe. You put a little earplugs so the little banging sounds don't bother you while you gain the scan. And that's an MRI that's dedicated, the A is the angiogram part to the arteries in the brain. The other modality you may hear is a CT angiogram. It's, um, it's similar, but slightly different. So it'll be a magnetic basis, radiation basis, CAT scan, but very similar. And you can get that as an outpatient and someone can take a look at it. And these, you know, we give, this is the pamphlet that we give our patients. I spend 30 minutes at least with every patient that has a family history. Take a screenshot if anybody wants to, because all my patients here get this handed to them. But if you're at home, I'm going to leave this up here for a moment, take a screenshot, because this is the, the magic script that can help you get screened by your primary care doctor. So the question is, how do I get the imaging studies to screen for aneurysms? And the bottom paragraph here, you call your PCP, and I provide the script for you. In quotes, I have a family member with an aneurysm and a strong family history of intracranial aneurysm. My relative's neurosurgeon has recommended that I be screened for intracranial aneurysms. And that's all you need to relay and I've never had anything that's bounced back. That's the critical information that your primary care needs to be able to order that test. And then I have the details of the test underneath. Um, and it's so important you may ask, well, why don't, you know, why doesn't the neurosurgeon order it? And because of the way the healthcare system works, your relatives aren't my patients. So I cannot go into their chart. That's a HIPAA violation. There's not a patient doctor relationship and they can't just see me for a screening. They have to start with a primary care that would then refer. So it has to be, and I tell my patients, the onus is on you. Sometimes I force the action by when I do a follow-up, say with a patient I've treated, and I know a family history, and I know they've been, they've been avoiding it. I'll say, okay, when I see you in six months, you're bringing your sister, your mom, and your other aunt, because I want to see them face-to-face -face and, and, and impress upon them the importance of it. So I will make a point to impart that in, in, you know, in front of them. But it's so important to know that it's really up to you if you're someone who's had a rupture and you've been told because of your family history you have to get your sisters. It's you are the advocate. And it's, it's remarkable how many times it doesn't happen, but I'll say one thing is for sure. Moms always get their kids screened. I've never seen that fail. So they, their kids listen to their mom. 
but getting siblings and others, it happens very, very rarely. All right, thank you for that, Dr. Spioto. That's great information. Before we get into the kind of question and answer section, Sharon, I wanna kind of kick it over to you as our professional reporter here to maybe get some of the other pressing questions on this topic out, um, you know, ahead of some of the questions that may address it with you, just um, having a little chat with Dr. Spioda. Yeah, I, I'm curious because I am always asking Dr. Spioda what other doctors, what other physicians are doing and how they're, what questions that they're asking. And I spoke to a neurologist this week who said that it, there's a particular type of kidney disease that um, can be correlated with um, aneurysms. And that's something that she, you know, will then suggest that the person has an MRA or something if they have that particular disease. Is that is that something that you recommend? And then the other thing is people who just have not necessarily brain bleed in their families, but have a chronic history of headaches and migraines, should they be screened? Absolutely, great question. So with regards to the kidneys, so yes, there's a disorder, polycystic kidney disease, where the cyst, this sort of got fragility, builds these cysts, and people go on to ultimately have kidney failure. But we think whatever genetic disposition is leading to that disease in the kidneys, also contributes to fragility in the arteries. Again, aneurysm is just the wear and tear of the artery due to the stress of the blood pulsating. Every heartbeat has a rush of blood. You feel your pulse is sort of a psh, psh, and that is a mechanical stress. So if you have an inherent fragility, it's more likely to have an aneurysm that can form in your lifetime. So exactly right, people with that polycystic kidney disease, we definitely screen early on because it's a very high association. There's other diseases like Ehlers-Danlos and Marfan's where people have, it's a mixed connected tissue disorder. Where they have a relative elasticity. And these are people that are tall and thin with triple jointed. And they have abdominal aortic, so aneurysms in their belly and their chest can also form, but they also have predilections um, in the brain. With regards to genetics, of course the family history is a genetic study, but it's, it's an old fashioned one just by history taking. We are really just starting understand that the actual genetics, meaning here's the actual gene that predisposes it. And of course, outside of the, the single gene, there'll be all the environmental factors that also contribute. But we're not quite there. We, there are some genes that have been associated with a higher predilection for aneurysm. I think in the next 10 years, as we identify them more, and medicine launches into the individualized genomic era, which I think is coming soon, and we're starting that at USC. We're actually offering free genomic screening for all our patients. We want to get the whole state screened. That will be the next step. And we'll, we'll be better able to understand diseases and better be able to customize care for that. And that's going to be a, a, a really exciting advancement that I think will happen in the next 10 years or so. Yeah. You know, as a journalist, I like people to be really specific when they're talking about medical conditions, but you don't want to you know, a lot of people just don't want to know the minutia of what it is, but you often hear this person passed away, this person died due to an aneurysm. And it's not always a brain aneurysm. It could be an aortic aneurysm. My father passed away from an aortic aneurysm, an aortic dissection. Is there a great correlation between aneurysms, as you mentioned, in other part of the bodies and then having a brain aneurysm? That correlation is much, much weaker. And that wouldn't, that wouldn't trigger a screening like, like a family history of the brain aneurysms. The exception being if you have those disorders would lead to aneurysms forming throughout the body, then, then, then we'd expect you to be more likely to have an aneurysm in the brain also. But by themselves, though, that's a much, much, much weaker association. That's something that was up for debate for many decades. So that's not something that would trigger on its own. Yeah. Uh, what about the people who, and I have so many friends and survivors where this has happened, where they went to the primary care physician and the primary care physician was like, you know, you're stressed, you're a working woman, you've got kids, it's like a stressful life. So, you know, just rest or, you know, they, they, they just never think that it could be this perhaps. Um, maybe tell you to take, go home, take some pain meds, maybe some Tylenol, Advil, and then call us the next day. I mean, yeah. it's a minute by minute thing, right? If I call you the next day, I'm not here the next day. I may not be here the next few minutes if I don't take the right, right steps. So, how do we how do we make sure that our doctors tell us what to do? You know, absolutely, at the right time? absolutely, and that's a tough one because, of course, there's so many causes of headaches. And headache, back pain is probably the number, the first and second most common complaints. So you can't possibly screen everybody with a headache, but 
And that's what presents a problem. And, and this, you know, with aneurysms, most commonly there are no symptoms. And that's the scary part. The first symptom can be the devastating symptom. Like you had the worst headache, but even you, you were in the best possible scenario where you were able to, you know, call, call your husband and get help and, and leave the, uh, the yoga facility. Some people just are comatose or dead. There aren't a small number of patients. People can have a warning, a sentinel hemorrhage, we call it. A little, a smaller version of a rupture is really a rupture. And people can have a micro rupture or a leak that can happen a week or so beforehand. But that can also be careful, you know, it can be tough to distinguish. Um, of course, when you have the big headache, that's something people don't, don't uh, ignore. But I think the best advice I can say is primary care is tough because headaches are so common. Migraines, chronic headaches, stress. I think in this world of overstimulation and working around the clock and never leaving work is probably worse. But if you're having headaches that are very different, and we always ask, if someone comes to me with a bad headache, I always ask, do you have headaches? Because some people just have headaches or not. If it's something that's different and you feel, it's, you're, you know your body best. So if it's something that feels different for you, advocate for yourself. There may not be clear guidelines on when to screen at that point or not, but have the discussion of the primary care um, and, and, and approach that as a team. Yeah. Um, I know there have been so many advancements in, in the technology that's used to scan for brain aneurysms, but I also know that many uh, neurosurgeons, neurologists have the facilities that they respect and that they believe the scans and some that they're not too sure about. And so as patients, how can we know that, yes, it's important to get screened, but is there something we should be looking for to make sure that it's a type of screening that you would do for your patients if we don't live anywhere near you um, to make sure we're getting it done properly? Absolutely. That's a great, great point. And so it gets to a really important thing is if you have an aneurysm, you need to be at a place that treats and monitors aneurysms very commonly. Something that's not, I'll tell patients when having an aneurysm is such a scary proposition. I always tell them it's a scary really scary for you. For me, it's routine because I do it every day. And that's what you want. You want to be in a place where it's not scary for the doctors, to put it bluntly. So you want to be in a place where not just the doctors, the team, not just the people treating you, the people that are looking at the scans is always extra set of eyes. Because to your great question is, you get a screening study and that quality of the study can differ from hospital to hospital. In general, if you go in a busy place, that's a teaching hospital, a big tertiary care center that treats complex diseases. And especially in cities, those are gonna be better equipped with really high resolution, really fine cut MRIs and CTAs that can really pick up small aneurysm. Why is it important? It may be an aneurysm that's too small to treat then, but if it's not picked up, you may not follow up on it. So it's so important, like I mentioned before, risk factors like aneurysm can grow. So there's definitely places, the, the branches of the arteries in the brain are very complex, three-dimensionally. They take a lot of turns. Some of them are hairpin turns. They go through the skull where it can be hard to see. And they'd enter different compartments. They take very sharp turns and there's lots of branching points. So it's very easy to tuck in a small aneurysm and hide it from the eyes view. But at a place where there's trained radiologists, neurosurgeons, neurologists who are reviewing these types of studies daily, and who have um, the latest in, in equipment with it, whether it be MRI or CT, where it has the higher resolution, then you're much less likely to have what the worst case scenario is you get a screen study. You've gone through all that, you convince your sister, she goes out and it's read as normal, but there's an aneurysm that's hidden. And then now your sister now is in that modality of let's follow up in five years because it was clean, when in fact, maybe we will follow with a year follow up because they saw, they saw a small aneurysm and looking for even a tiny amount of growth or a change in the, the shape of it. But that may, be, that may go unnoticed. So very, very important message. If you have an aneurysm, that's a big deal. Whether you get it treated or being followed, not something to play around with. Find a hospital that you trust. Find a neurosurgeon or someone who's going to follow you that you trust. Meet them. If you want a second opinion, don't be shy. Meet them. I'm, I'm often, I'm the second opinion for other physicians. Rarely do people get a second opinion, but I say, absolutely, please do. You have to be comfortable. This is a big deal. Again, big deal for you, for us, it's routine. But you want to be at a place that does this a lot. Is it possible, you said that they can hide, that aneurysms can hide. 
I'm always surprised when someone tells me that they had a brain bleed, but no one knows really where it came from or how it happened. Mm -hmm. Is that normal to that you don't know how that happened? I know the brain's complicated, but right, right. So there's scary. so there are times when there's so you there are times it's it's the minority cases when you can have an aneurysmal pattern bleed. I mean, on the CAT scan, we look at it and we say there's an aneurysm somewhere. We've got to go find it and treat it because the pattern, of course, brain bleed to the layperson is a brain bleed, but there's probably a thousand different types of brain bleeds based on the pattern, location, how the patient looks at the time of presentation. It could be a tumor to leak. It could be something related to blood pressure elevation. It could be something related to a blood thinner. Someone's on for like a heart valve or a heart sense. The aneurysmal pattern bleed is a very unique one. All the things like trauma can mimic it. Um, so when we see an aneurysmal pattern, we, we conclude that there's an aneurysm there until we prove it otherwise. And that happens in a minority of cases, we may do a really detailed study like a CTA, MRA, and then even the diagnostic angiogram, a catheter angiogram or a basic one. And we're looking for an aneurysm. We'll look at, we'll survey the entire anatomy, but based on the pattern, we're really honing in on certain areas based on the anatomy, where things are, are bleeding and where they're pointing. So in a minority cases, we do, and we see enough here that we see it you know, several times a year. We don't see one on the first angiogram, but everything looks, you know, looks like a duck, walks like a duck. So we're assuming it's a duck. And again, the, the repercussions of missing one are so big. So we don't stop there. We actually continue to look. We'll look at a week later, even six weeks later. And the assumption is that there may be a small aneurysm. And when it's burst, and then the bleeding pressure kind of stops it from bleeding, that it flattens it. So you may not, it may be invisible. And that's why you do the surveillance imaging. So in minority cases, it can hide that way. That's a unique situation. We just keep checking until we, we're, we're, we're never, we gotta be 110% sure that it was not an aneurysm because if we find one, we wanna treat it. Absolutely, absolutely. My last question, cause I know everyone has so many questions and Christine's gonna get to them right away. But the big question that comes up in support group meetings when someone discovers that they, you know, they should probably have a family member screened is how is insurance gonna pay for this or will insurance pay for this? Or I've tried, and my primary care physician is going to order it, but the insurance company won't pay for it. How do we get make sure that we're not footing the bill for what's a very, very expensive process? Absolutely, and great question also. So that's where that magic script that I put on the screen a few minutes ago helps. If you talk to your primary care and, and share that script, that is the documentation your primary care needs to put in the chart in order to justify that scan. Now, it's a healthcare system is not perfect, so there's a, nothing worse 100% of the time. We have heard of um, scans getting rejected by insurance. You know, the business of insurance, thought, fortunately, to try to streamline and not, you know, cover expensive tests. In that time, we can provide more documentation. Sometimes it's a call from the physician to the insurance. I mean, I've done that for my patients. You'd be surprised sometimes, again, the business of insurance is not always what our business is, which is to put the patient at the center. So I've, been, I've gotten on the phone and waited two hours to talk to an insurance person. Usually they can get on the phone, it's a very quick phone call. They're just trying to see if you really want it. But your doctors will advocate for you. But it starts with you advocating for yourself and equipping them with the information about the family history and the importance of it. Okay, so I have friends that I've just made here in the chat that are asking the question that I have. And then I promise, Christine, it's all yours, which is how, good, how long are my clips good for? If I got them in 2016, how many years are they are they good for? So clips are very, very durable and they're not gonna disappear, they're not gonna go away. The, the question is more about can the aneurysm grow or come back? So clips will always be good. So we generally do, there's two different modalities. One is the clipping, which is involved in incision, a bone window, working through the folds of the brain, opening them up a little bit, going underneath the brain and putting a clip like a noose. So if my, arms are the branches, my, my torso is the, the branch coming in, my head is the aneurysm, the clip goes across and just singes it off. And we know if you get, we always get pictures afterwards to follow it. It's also important to, to make sure there's not a second or third aneurysm. Because remember family history or personal history of aneurysm it predisposes you to having aneurysms down the road. But clipping is very, very durable. So if you look at it a year, two years, and it hasn't come back, it's very, very, very unlikely to come back. It actually works very, very well. 
The other uh, treatment approach is where you go within the arteries, so not from the outside, but as you travel either from the rest of the hip, and that's sometimes it's called the coiling. Um, and you actually put a little catheter that's very, very tiny with wires that are the size of your hairs. And we put a little catheter into the aneurysm from the inside and pack it with these coils so it clogs and shuts down. And those we have to continue to follow. Also a very good treatment modality, but not quite as durable, very, very good also, but not quite as durable as clipping. Easier recovery. So every aneurysm, the discussion, I know you had a clipping, the clipping versus coiling is individualized to the patient and the aneurysm and a host of other factors. And you have to just pick the modality that works the best. Thank you so much. There's so many questions. Christine, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Sharon, so much. Appreciate it. So here's something somebody asked before everybody got on that is not something that I've ever heard asked before. Um, they said that they saw a physician when, when they looked at the scan of their aneurysm, and this person was somebody who was adopted, and the doctor told them they could tell that their aneurysm was a familial aneurysm. Is that possible? Interesting. Yeah. Without more information, it's hard for me to reconcile that unless he saw, you know, perhaps there are multiple aneurysms, but familial aneurysm, unless you have um, the family history in front of you, it's really hard to put that together. Now, we do see, you know, someone has an aneurysm, they're from an adopted family, they don't have, you know, they don't have ability to have a family history. Um, of course, that family that was their biological parents, they don't know that they have an aneurysm. So that always presents a really interesting and, and tough dilemma. Okay, thank you. Another common theme that has come up, and I know a lot of these questions have been touched upon a little bit, but people are definitely concerned about their children. You know, what is the best age to scan a child? How often does it continue throughout their life? And how much do pediatricians know about this, that if a parent says, hey, listen, you know, my husband had an aneurysm three years ago, we're worried about our son, how receptive would they be to order that scan? Absolutely. Great, great question. By the way, audience, you guys are doing a great job. So, so, so important. I know, Sharon, we're, we're going to talk about getting your children screened. So many different factors. And the age at which to screen, there's no textbook page to turn to that has a chart with a recipe. So it's really individualized again. So I sort of you know, survey the family. Were these ruptures happening at a younger age? You know, the family history is, look at the mom and her sister, so now the aunt of the children had ruptures in their early 40s. I'm going to be screening much earlier. And if they were in their 70s. So age at the time of rupture, and then if that rupture was also fatal, did it lead to the demise of that person who had the rupture? Then both the younger age and the more severe rupture, I will start screening earlier. So really young ruptures, people in the 30s and 40s, I'll start screening 13, 15. Again, it could be different, have a discussion with your doctor. But very similar um, engagement that we do with the adults, with the primary care, with the pediatrician. It's the exact same engagement. They're always very receptive and thankful that we brought it up. But definitely children, if, if especially if the mother and the aunt or mother and grandmother has had ruptures, it's more common in women, but any daughters and sons should both get screened. I think a reasonable time is 18 to 20. Um, I wouldn't wait to 25 or 30. And then an MRI, MRA is very reasonable, non-invasive. There's, there's no needles. You're not being hurt. You're just being slid into this. You're laying down, relaxing for 15 minutes in this MRI where just your head is in it, in the tube. So it's not that claustrophobic, not that scary when you look at it. And there's MRI techs that are doing this every day. They usually have a good sense of humor. They're a people person. They enjoy interacting with people. So the MRI tech and you will have a great time. You'll probably chat. They'll slide you in, they'll play some music. You, it'll be done before you know it. So don't fear it. It's human nature to fear. But it is just, and it's scary. If I have it, I might be told you have an aneurysm. And that's scary. But I promise you the scariest thing is to have one, especially for your mom, have one and not get checked. And then it ruptures and you don't make it or you make it, but you know, you're not right. You're not independent. You can't enjoy life. That is the scariest part. And to think that we could have seen it and closely watched it or even treated it to remove it from the equation is such a missed opportunity. And this is why this is so important. Thank you. Another question is, we know people can have more than one aneurysm. Is it more likely when there's a familial connection and how often might that occur? 
Absolutely. So one in five, so 20% of patients will have multiplicity of aneurysm. So an additional aneurysm. And in family histories, especially if there's multiple, when my mom had a ruptured and two other ones that she had treated, my aunt had four aneurysms, much more likely to have multiplicity of aneurysms. It probably just predisposes, we talked about that inherent, you know, fragility of the arteries. So if you think about it, if it's more fragile, you're more likely to develop them and they're more likely to grow faster and rupture at a younger age. And if you have extra fragility of the vessels, instead of forming aneurysm in one spot in the brain arteries, you'll have it at three or four spots. So that association is definitely, is definitely there. Very, very common for someone who comes in with a rupture. We treat the aneurysm that ruptured, of course, first. That's the most concerning one because it's fragile, could rupture again. And we often find a second one, very, very common, or a third one. Not to scare people, but I have had patients that have had more than 10 aneurysms that I found. That's the exception. But having two or three aneurysms, extremely, extremely common. So again, another reason why it's so important to be screened. And after you get treated, we of course follow up the aneurysm we treated. But after a couple of years, we're less worried about that one. We're actually more worried about other aneurysms elsewhere. All right, thank you for that. Since somewhat related to that is people are asking, we know there are risk factors such as smoking, certain ethnicities that can contribute to aneurysm formation and rupture in age, um, women more than men. Does that play into increasing it being more common in your family if you also have these other risk factors? Yes, absolutely. So if you have a family history, so important because beyond just screening and maybe getting your aneurysm treated when you wouldn't otherwise know about it, then that is the perfect opportunity to stop smoking if you're smoking or to never start to begin with is the best because smoking is like pouring gas on a, on a fire. Um, smoking is the worst thing you can do if you have an aneurysm. You know, it predisposes them to enlarge and rupture. And if they rupture, you're less likely to survive. So smoking just augments that risk. Um, of course, the gender you can't change, treating the blood pressure is very, very important. But smoking is the single most important thing you can do that's preventative. It's, uh, I know it's hard, but um, that's where you need a family support. There's online supports, um, brain injury foundation support, patient groups, et cetera. Smoking is hard, but you have to uh, find a way to, to quit. Excellent. Another question people have been asking is the role of migraines. And this is someone asking that they do have a family history. They also have aortic aneurysms in the family. And this woman's had a history of my migraines. Her children now have migraines. Is that an added concern? And that's one that's more into the gray zone where it's not a clear cut, but certainly abdominal aortic aneurysms, you have migraines in family history. It could just be migraines. It could be something else. That's where we're outside the bounds of any standard guidelines of what to do. This goes back to, you know, your body, if something's different about it, be your own advocate, talk to your primary care. I always prefer to err on the side of caution. You know, we talked about the family history. Sometimes you can't prove that they weren't aneurysms. So we just assume they are, because that's the worst case scenario. Um, of course, as a balance, you can't, if everybody with a headache got an MRI, you know, the MRI machines would be tied up throughout the country. So really listen to your body and have a discussion with your primary care doctor. Okay, another thing, and again, this could be a whole nother webinar, so we're gonna, we can lightly touch upon it now, but right, you have a family history, you do get a scan, you find out you have one and they wanna watch it. Like what do you suggest to people who are told to watch it? So the, the first and most important is find a doctor that you really trust, do your homework, you know, as opposed to the rupture, like a stroke, we treat these things that are so time sensitive and, and you have to just go where you're taken. But even small hospitals, they know to go to the big hospital. But now if it's an aneurysm, it's not ruptured, you have time. There's nothing urgent about it. So do your homework. Now with online, it's easy. Just look at the profiles. Find a hospital with a good reputation and ask your doctors, you know, there's something you do routinely. What's your volume? Don't be afraid. People ask me, there's nothing wrong with educating yourself and asking. Um, do not be shy because you have a chance to get a second opinion or third opinion. You know, do your, you know, we're offering a virtual second opinions. You can only have to leave your living room. I get your MRI, your CTA. I look at your aneurysm. We talk on the phone. We talk about the risk factors. I show you the pictures and I give you my second opinion. Um, so more and more centers are offering that. Uh, take advantage of that. 
but make sure you're confident with the center and the physician who's gonna be watching you. As far as treatment or management plans, sometimes a family history is so strong that I'm not even willing to watch it. So we will treat an aneurysm, even a small one that I would watch in somebody else without the family history. But again, that's an individualized discussion. If we decide to watch it, then something very reasonable is the first to watch it closely maybe every year because we don't know if it's grown. We only have that one snapshot in time. We don't know if it stayed the same for 10 years or if it actually doubled in size the last year. So initially, we don't know if that aneurysm is behaving badly, as I call it or not. So we want to do a quick follow-up, maybe six months to a year, depending on, on the other circumstances. Then after we watch it for a couple of years, the aneurysm has proved that it's staying unchanged. We may space that out. And again, it um, may one, you know, one year initially and two years, and that's really an individualized discussion between you and your doctor. But the main point is if you have a strong family history, especially young fatal ruptures, mom, grandmother in their 40s died. They had small aneurysms themselves. You're 30 with a small aneurysm. We're going to find a way to treat the aneurysm safely for you and not expose you to the possibility of a rupturing. But again, it kind of enforces that every discussion about the aneurysm takes into account the entire context of that patient. It's really individualized to that patient. Okay, thank you. And another question I have is, could you let people know what you think the role of AI is going to be in aneurysm detection and management going forward? Absolutely, absolutely. Let me share my screen again. So I think we're, this is a great time to be uh, entering in medicine. I tell my students, uh, I don't think there's a better time to be entering medicine because the, the advances that we're anticipating with artificial intelligence are going to permeate all of medicine. And it's really starting with imaging. So helping us look at images. Um, but in the next 10 or 20 years, it's going to revolutionize medicine. I think it'll be the biggest advancements we've ever seen. You know, we had germ theory in the late 1880s and penicillin. This is going to be the biggest advancement. So we talked about the importance of getting screened. And what is that? You're getting a study of MRI or CAT scan of the brain arteries, and you're looking for an aneurysm. You want to have it a high volume center of people that are trained to do it, that are doing it every day. They're less likely to miss a small aneurysm. We talked about it could be hidden. But we're human beings, so we are going to miss things. It's just a fact. So the idea is not that the artificial intelligence is going to replace a radiologist and neurosurgeon reviewing it, but they're going to actually augment and be a second set of eyes that can help identify aneurysms. So here in this in these slides, I have an aneurysm here you can see uh, coming off the posterior wall of the carotid. This is a CT angiogram. This is a diagnostic angiogram. And here in the cartoon showing in, in bright red with careful measurements, that's all automatically detected by an artificial intelligence software. So that's helping us to look at aneurysms. Hey, look at this area more closely. It's going to make it less likely that we miss an aneurysm. And here's some other examples. These are large aneurysms. You see these out pouchings here. And these are our MRAs. So the previous example was a CT angiogram. This is an MR angiogram. And here's the cartoon. You can move it around. It's great for patient education. But it's just helping us to identify so we don't miss one. And this is another example. These are large, but it can really help us with a small one. Here in this case, on the CT angiogram and the conventional catheter angiogram, there's a tiny little aneurysm that could be very well missed. In fact, this one on the CT scan was missed. It's tucked in right under that bifurcation. There's a branch coursing over it. It's small, regularly shaped. And here the software is able to detect it. Again, just so important, it may not be something that triggers treatment right away, but now you're in the pathway of, do you have an aneurysm? Instead of the no pathway, you're in the yes pathway. And now you're, you're established to have routine surveillance to look for size changes or shape changes. So it's so important that we don't miss, and it's really hard to put a number on how many we may, we may miss. It depends, of course, on the size of the aneurysm and where it's hiding. We know in hospitals that are less comfortable than not reviewing these types of studies daily, they're more likely to miss them. And that's often in smaller hospitals or away from cities. But what an opportunity. If we can have AI, and I think it will enhance us and not miss any, that's a huge, huge win for us. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, my colleague Lynn is on. I think she has spotted maybe a question or two that I have not seen. So Lynn, if you want to ask those. I have a quick question before Lynn gets on, if you don't mind, Dr. Spiota, and that is, what is the size? What is the size that you should look at 
you know, if you you're told it's three millimeters, if it's five millimeters, two millimeters, when do when do you start really looking at it and treating it? Absolutely, great question. And there's some older evidence from 20 years ago. There was a magic number, six or seven millimeters, and that was older. And there were some limitations to that study, but unfortunately, it kind of stuck in a lot of physicians. Or if it's under six, seven millimeters, I don't have to worry about it. Turns out it's not that simple. You know, it's all these individual factors. It's not just the size of it, but it's also the shape of it. We showed that little double ice cream scoop example earlier. And also where it originates, there's some aneurysms in some locations where actually they tend to rupture at a smaller size. And in one particular location, the anterior communicating artery, it's in a secondary branch. So the, the artery is already branched a second time. So just like in the brain, like a tree, you have the trunk as the branches branch, it gets smaller and smaller as they get further from the trunk. So a smaller aneurysm of a smaller branch, it's proportionally larger than it's off a bigger branch. And what's really scary, we looked at our own data throughout South Carolina, this has been shown in bigger national studies also, about a quarter to a third of the rough aneurysms that come in that bled are well under that six millimeters, actually four millimeters or less. So by the old understanding of it, they should not have ruptured, of course they did. So that's why it's such the size is just one of the factors. It is the, the age of the patient. Do they have any other illnesses? The family history being probably the most important one. And that often trumps any other considerations, the, the shape or morphology, morphology of it. And also how easy or, or not is it to treat? If we have a relatively straightforward treatment that's low risk versus a more complicated treatment, these are all decisions that factor in. It's usually about an hour discussion that I have with the patient and we come up with an individualized treatment plan for their aneurysm for them. Right. I know, I know that there, you know, that your slide showed it's only 3% of the population that has aneurysms. But when you look at the other statistics, as Christine mentioned, of blacks and Latinos being twice as likely as whites to have them rupture, of women being more likely than men to have them in the first place. If you have those factors together and then a possibility of a family history, does that make it more likely that you could have an aneurysm? And then we're also talking about those that may be people that are less likely to seek preventative care regularly. So where, where are those trucks that have the MRA machines on them yes, in the communities yes. that so people can get screened yeah. more easily? Yeah, absolutely. The, the healthcare disparities are, are pervasive and, and this is not immune to that. So we definitely see that all those factors you outlined. So, and this is why I'm doing this and Christine has dedicated her whole adult life to doing this. It's so important that we get the word out. And even with family history, we think about it, it's scary. So by the guidelines, if you have two family members, you screen everybody, right? But let's say your sister had one and you don't get screened, you could be the one with a rupture being the second one that triggers everybody. So if, if someone's in the family with a ruptured aneurysm, advocate for yourself because you don't want to be the second one that triggers everybody else to be screened and you could have also been screened. So um, advocate, your doctors will advocate for you, have that discussion, talk to your family, get that history. I mean, you know, Christine mentioned it before, sometimes people don't talk to each other. Uh, or Sharon, I think you mentioned it, is, is have those discussions. Ask, people don't want to talk about it. You, you see each other Thanksgiving, that's not the topic you want to bring up. But sometimes there's a family history, people haven't shared it with, with each other. So it's just so important that we're number one aware of it because it is a preventable disease. We can treat it and not have it rupture. And again, a rupture is one of the most, there, there isn't anything that's more serious than an aneurysm rupture. Um, and Sharon, I appreciate you sharing your story. Such an inspiration for all of us. It's amazing to see you doing as well because it really is a tremendous uphill battle. You alluded to that two-week hospitalization. You probably don't remember any of it. And that's that's what I commonly hear. Even in the best, you were in the best possible condition coming through it, and you have no recollection of the time period. Because yeah, everything that you were going on with the recovery, um, it's just such a critical and severe illness that you can have. I'm glad to be here for sure, for sure. Yeah, no, thanks. And Lynn, did you have that question you wanted to get? Yeah, you know, um, there was someone that asked um, what type of therapist is best to see after a rupture uh, craniotomy for someone who has few physical side effects, but ongoing daily headaches, concentration issues, um, she said, what would be the benefit of a, of a neuropsychologist? The neuropsychologist, and then I'll, I'll briefly, and then I want to 
have Sharon because she she lived through it. So I often will refer to neuropsychologists. And again, being advocates, there's not many of them. So sometimes there's a long waiting line. So you got to find, you know, your small hospital is not going to have one. So it's going to be the bigger volume centers that have one. But they can assess, you know, specific areas that you have to kind of exercise the brain like anything else. You know, you injure your knee, you rehab it. The brain is no different. But they can have targeted therapies for, you know, if it's a, if it's a memory or a language deficit. Occupational therapists, I'm also very big on uh, referring to. They can help with things, you know, getting around the day. Um, if you have a, a slight weakness and, you know, driving, getting around the house, assessing your house for safety, all these things that are very, very important. Yeah, I, I just think it's important to seek to seek those um, therapists, uh, like Dr. Spirito said, occupational if you need to. My first um, outing was to buy a sandwich for myself. And the occupational therapist stood in the corner and made me go up and have the money and figure out how to calculate the money. But I was more worried about the small child next to me knocking me over because I was still trying to figure out how to balance. So it's the things we take for granted that we may have been able to do every day with no problem that be then become such big issues. And in terms of the emotional recovery, again, it is a traumatic experience. And there are things that I learned two particular words that stand out to me that I never knew. One is I'm freaking out, I'm crying all the time, what's wrong with me? And the lability, the emotional, being emotionally labile is an actual medical condition. So I'm not just freaking out just because I'm crazy, I'm freaking out because my brain is injured. And the other was, you know, again, I mentioned Starbucks before, I do drink, drink at least a cup of coffee a day and there is no amount of coffee they can get you through when you're tired after a brain injury, no amount of coffee. And so knowing that there's something called cognitive fatigue, then in fact is a condition, a medical condition. That's why you have to go back to work a couple hours a day. That's why you can't go back full time. That may be why you cannot go back after three months because you're not able to, you know, because of that. So I think the specialist that then can help you structure the documents that you need to tell an employer or to just come up with the words to explain it to your partner, your children, your family members. So very important. So very important. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Dr. Spiota. Um, this topic is obviously very important. Thank you to everybody who signed on to join. Um, you inspire all of us at the foundation to keep doing what we're doing, to raise awareness, get more education, get more research funding, advocating on Capitol Hill, March 23rd. If anybody wants to join us, um, the work, Sharon will be there. We're doing is also so, so important. We need all of you. So thank you all so very much. Um, Sharon, Dr. Spiota, any closing words? I just want to thank you, Christine, for all that you do and all that the Brain Aneurysm Foundation is doing. And Dr. Spiota, as you're teaching, please share our stories with your students. We need them. Some of the best advice and the most smiling face I saw was a first year resident who's now chief resident at Montefiore. And that is so special. They touch us and they have to understand there's much more than the science that's what they're doing. It's a very personal connection. And thank you for having that and sharing that with your students. Absolutely. And Christine, thanks so much for the uh, never-ending support. Sharon, thanks for sharing your story. I really appreciate all the participants. Please, please spread the word. Let's get this out on social media. Let's make sure we get this out to as many people because this actually does save lives. So very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.